We are continuing to look at Revelation chapter 13, and in this message I will be discussing the unholy trinity. This is the devil's twisted imitation of the good, wonderful, holy uh, trinity. So the plan for this message is to uh, briefly review the first half of, of Revelation 13 concerning the first beast. Now, we've already had two messages on the first half of Revelation 13, so I'm going to mainly focus on a few aspects not yet covered, and then begin to look at the second beast. There are two beasts in Revelation 13. Uh, the second beast is also called the false prophet. And then along with that, we will look at the un unholy trinity uh, in the second half of Revelation 13. So uh, we'll be beginning by looking at the first half of Revelation 13 in the first beast. But before we jump into that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a difficult topic. We wish that there was not evil in the world. Uh, but there is, and we, mankind, humanity, uh, let it in by our sin, beginning with Adam and Eve, but each of us have also sinned. Uh, we thank you that you have not given up on us, that you have rescued us at great cost to yourself. And although in one way the war is over, in, in terms of it being uh, the outcome being certain, uh, yet uh, the battle still rages on. So strengthen our hearts to be faithful to you. And I pray that everyone listening to this will choose to be on the right side, on your side, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin in chapter 1. Um, John writes, And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On its horns were ten crowns, and on its heads were blasphemous names. The beast I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. One of its heads appeared to be fatally wounded, but its fatal wound was healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. So let's slow down here and uh, talk about uh, this. Its fatal wound was healed. Now, uh, most people believe that this is referring to a human uh, ruler. And um, some people think it's maybe a, a ruler that lived near John's time in the Roman Empire. Uh, some people think it, he, it lived some time in human history. And many people believe that this is mainly focused on someone in the future, a, a final, uh, super terrible um, antichrist. And to be sure, there have been many um, evil rulers, and there are today, but, but I do think that a final, most terrible evil ruler is, is, is still coming. Now, why does it say its, its fatal wound was healed? Well, the beast appears to die and come back to life. Um, this raises a, a question. Is, is there going to be some evil ruler who actually dies and comes back to life? I'm not sure. Uh, Revelation has a lot of symbolism in it and a lot of symbolic language. Um, I think it's possible that it's only going to appear that he dies and comes back to life, or that he metaphorically dies and comes back to life. Uh, but I think it's entirely possible that um, the final evil ruler at some point uh, will, will, will die, will be uh, killed, and, um, and will be resuscitated in some way. Now, he's not going to come back to life to live forever, um, but, but he will come back, and that this will be a walk of... Uh, satanic power that will cause this to happen. Um, I don't know for sure that's how it's going to be fulfilled. But notice something else. This this ideal that uh, of dying and coming back to life, did that remind you of anyone? And and obviously, if, if uh, 
your Christian answer is yes, it, 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 Jesus did that. Jesus died and come back, came back to life. So the devil often produces counterfeits that in some ways mimic God's truth. So God has prophets and the devil has false prophets. God has teachers, the devil has false teachers. There's a true religion, uh, uh, true Christianity, biblical Christianity, but the devil has a pile of false religions. And here we see the ultimate counterfeit, a false Christ, an antichrist. He's against Christ, but he's also trying to mimic and take Christ's place in people's hearts, in people's imagination, and in terms of being uh, worshipped, in terms of having authority over the whole earth. And so uh, the, the devil often tries to uh, mimic what, what God has done. And sometimes God allows him a certain amount to do this. Um, so it says, the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Well, the whole earth should be following Jesus. He already rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. Uh, he died for us because of his great love. He didn't die as a result of doing anything bad. And, um, uh, and now he's living in glory. So we should be following Jesus. However, it appears that um, most people in the world are going to be deceived by the Antichrist, the, the final uh, manifestation of the Antichrist, and will, will, will follow him. Um, continuing in verse 4, they worship the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. Remember, the dragon is a symbol for, for Satan. And, and remember, the beast represents evil human government, uh, and, and it could be evil human government in general, or it can re refer to the one specific final terrible government led by the, the final Antichrist. Um, in, in First John, we're told that um, you thought the, the Antichrist is coming. Uh, even now, many Antichrists have come. Uh, so there, there are many Antichrists, but there, see, it seems that there's going to be one final terrible one. And they worship the beast, saying... Who is like the beast? Uh, who is able to wage war against it? So they, the people who who are not uh, Christians, who are following the beast, they are treating the dragon, that, that's Satan, and the beast like God. Uh, we shouldn't worship anyone other than God. And also this, this saying that uh, something like, well, who is like the beast? You know, no one else is like him. He's so he's so incredible. He's so powerful. Uh, you know, no one can wage war against him. That's the idea of what they're saying. Well, they should be saying that about God. They should be saying that about Jesus. Now, this is a rhetorical question. The people who are worshiping the beast and saying this don't aren't intending somebody to give an answer. But it turns out that later there there actually is. Uh, uh, an answer, and it's an encouraging answer to their question. So right here in Revelation 13, it doesn't give an answer, but later in Revelation 17, it says, as a matter of fact, there is somebody who can wage war against the beast. Now, it's not uh, me or you and our earthly power. It's it's not anything like, you know, the United States military. You know, it seems that by God's grace, probably still the most powerful military in the world right now, but when that final Antichrist comes, no human force, no human power, no nation is going to be able to wage war against the beast. But that doesn't mean that no one can. Uh, let's let's, let's uh, peek ahead to Revelation 17 and get some good news. These, it, and it's talking about the beast, and, and, and um, it says, These will make war against the Lamb. Hallelujah, that's Jesus. He's called the Lamb because he loves us so much he died for our sins. These will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will conquer them, because He, the Lamb, He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Those with Him are called uh, chosen and faithful. So there's uh, sometimes people ask rhetorical questions, and they're kind of uh, snotty about it. They're like, "Well, who's like the beast? Who's able to wage war against it?" And, and, and they don't they don't realize there's actually an answer to the questions that they are asking. It's okay to ask hard questions, but people need to 
uh, be willing to listen, seek out, listen to the answers. And there's an answer. I know who can beat the beast. Jesus. Jesus can squash the beast like a little bug. Jesus is way more powerful than the beast. Uh, he's way more powerful than the beast all by himself. And in addition to that, he's got armies of powerful, awesome angels with him. The beast doesn't have a chance. Uh, it's really foolish for the beast to make war against uh, Jesus, and he's going to lose. But back in Revelation 13, uh, uh, the beast was given a mouth to utter boast and blasphemies. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. So for a short period of time, this was the main topic of the message last week. For a short period of time, the beast is allowed to uh, rule uh, on the earth. And in terms of all three powers, nobody can beat it. Uh, but it's only for a little while. Remember, Jesus is going to come back. There's going to be a new earth where Jesus will reign forever and ever. Not for, 40, not for 42 months, but forever and ever. Continuing verse 6. Uh, it, the beast, began to speak blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his dwelling, those who dwell in heaven. And it was permitted to wage war against the saints and to conquer them. So, so this is in terms of what happens on the earth during this limited period of time. It was also given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So this is another way in which it's, it's a, a, a false version of Jesus. Jesus truly has authority over every, uh, has ultimate and eternal authority over all the nations. But, but the beast is allowed to, in a worldly way, he's allowed to crush and trample on and defeat and kill and persecute God's people for a limited period of time. Uh, all those who live on the earth will worship it, will worship the beast. Everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world, excuse me, in the book of life, uh, in the book of life of the Lamb who was slaughtered. So, praise God, even during the darkest days, not everyone is going to worship the beast. Uh, the uh, People whose names are written in the book of life. If you're a Christian, that's you. Your name is written in the book of life. And there are Christians around the world today who are living in beast-like nations. I, I discussed beast-like nations uh, a couple of messages ago in the Revelation series. And, um, uh, and, and yet there are faithful Christians all around the world, even in the darkest parts of the world, who are staying faithful. They are not giving in. They are not um, uh, giving up their faith in, in, in Jesus. Now, this statement written from the foundation of the world raises questions in, in people's minds, and I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but I'll mention it briefly. What, what does this mean uh, that, that um, the people who are, are Christians, God's people, their names were in the book from the, from the foundation of the world? Uh, one possibility is did God decide ahead of time who would have faith? And another possibility is did God know ahead of time who would have faith? Um, now, I, I suppose both of those could be true, but um, I, I, think, I think the focus is on number two. In Romans 8.29, it says, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So I think before God made the earth, uh, before the earth even existed, before there was any trees or oceans or mountains, and certainly before there were any people, God knew every single person who was going to live, and he knew which people would accept Jesus, which ones would have faith in him, and which ones would reject him. All of the people who he knew would have faith in him, he predestined. He made a wonderful destiny uh, for us uh, so that even though we begin, uh, we're sinners, we're messed up, we can't save ourselves, we're dependent on him for salvation, that uh, he, he predestines us to eventually uh, we're forgiven and that then we're going to be transformed so that we become like Jesus, conformed to the image of his son. We become like Jesus in terms of loving other people and loving God and purity and holiness. And that process of transformation will not be complete until we are resurrected um, 
But one day we will be completely like Jesus, hallelujah, in terms of our character, uh, believe it or not, in terms of holiness. That's what the Bible teaches. So I think that's what it's talking about. It's God, and God has our names in a book. Uh, he, he knows who, who's going to make it, and he has made a plan for us. And that's encouraging. Now, the book is called The Book of Life. Uh, in this book are the names of everyone who will live forever. That's why it's called The Book of Life. Uh, like it says in John 3.16, uh, um, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, uh, it's conditional, you have to believe in Jesus, will not perish. Uh, so people who, who don't believe in Jesus, they will perish. But if you believe in Jesus, you will not perish, but have eternal life. And so your name will be in the book of life. That's just, that's not a short life here on earth. That's referring to eternal life. You are going to live forever. Uh, now, the book of life is the book of life of the lamb who was slaughtered, which reminds us of the basic good news. We have eternal life because of our relationship with Jesus who died for our sins. So that is really good news. Uh, this is kind of a, a dark chapter in some ways, chapter 13, but there's some good news mixed in. Uh, now, continuing in verse 9, if anyone has ears to hear, let him uh, listen. If anyone is to be taken captive into captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword, he will be killed. This calls for endurance and faithfulness from the saints. So in other words, uh, while our life on earth is lived under the influence of beast-like governments, even if we aren't alive when the final Antichrist comes, there's a lot of evil in the world, and there's also false religions, and then later we're going to talk about Babylon, the seducing, uh, uh, alluring, pull, and temptation of luxuries and pleasures in this world that look good, but they end up destroying us if we go after them. Um, so, so, so we have to live in this world with all this evil and temptation and darkness and persecution. Um, and, and, and a lot of good people are going to be uh, killed and unjustly imprisoned. And, but our response is to endure. This calls for endurance and faithfulness. To stay faithful to God. Stay faithful to um, his mission. This is from the saints. If you're a Christian, that's you. The Bible uses the word saint to refer to all Christians. It means holy ones. And it's not because uh, we're perfect yet. It's because we have been forgiven and our destiny is to be transformed and to be perfect and holy. And so in God's eyes, positionally, we are already his holy ones, his saints. And we need to endure. We need to hang in there, not give up, and stay faithful. Now we're going to talk about the second half of Revelation 13. We're going to begin uh, in this message, but we'll talk about it more in at least one more message, Lord willing. So, verse 11. Uh, then I saw another beast uh, coming up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a lion. So, this is the second beast. And the second beast in the rest of the book of Revelation is called the false uh, prophet. Uh, it looks like a lamb. It has two horns like a lamb. Remember, in Revelation, the lamb is Jesus, but it's not really a lamb. It's like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, it's actually like the dragon. It speaks like the dragon, which is, of course, the, the, the devil. Um, so, so later in Revelation, as I mentioned, the second beast is called uh, the false prophet. All throughout the Bible and all throughout human history, there have been many false prophets and false teachers. Uh, and, and so, even if we don't live during the time when this final uh, Antichrist comes, there are things like that in the world today. And, and so, it's relevant to our lives. Uh, it, the, the, uh, the second beast, the false prophet, it exercises all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and compels the earth and those who live on it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. It also performs great signs, even causing 
fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. Um, so, so what's going on here? It, it, it seems that God um, allows this evil antichrist, uh, this evil be, uh, false prophet, to do some types of miracles. Now, are these uh, fake miracles that fool people into thinking they're real miracles? Or are they real miracles done with some kind of demonic power, satanic power? Um, I think that in the world, both of those things happen. There are a lot of fake miracles um, done just with trickery uh, that just fool gullible people. But I also think that there is real demonic power and that sometimes evil um, demonic forces are able to, to do some amount of uh, miraculous looking things. And uh, Jesus talked about this. Uh, it, back in Matthew 24, 24, it records Jesus saying, for false messiahs and false prophets. That's important. So there's going to be a final false messiah, the capital A Antichrist. But all throughout human history, from the time of Jesus until he comes back, there are false messiahs. So there are false messiahs in the world uh, today, uh, and, and there are false prophets uh, influencing the world today. Fal for false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So a lot of people are going to be deceived when the, f the, the false messiah does the, these uh, deceiving miracles, uh, but God's true people will not be deceived. Uh, Paul also talks about this in 2 Thessalonians. You know, the book of Revelation um, mostly isn't giving us new information. It's mostly uh, telling the same story that we already know about from the rest of the Bible, but in the form of a, a, a vision that uses these powerful symbols to impact our imagination. So, so, so this ideal, what John sees in his vision, was already uh, described by Jesus and by the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote, The coming of the lawless one, uh, that's probably the same as the Antichrist, probably the same as the second beast, the false prophet. The coming of the lawless, or, or perhaps it could be the first beast, the lawless one could be the first beast, um, the evil ruler. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan walks. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Uh, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So, so these people had a chance uh, to love the truth, to love God's truth, that Jesus is it's Lord and that he saves us, and, but they didn't love it. And so instead, they get led astray when the false prophets and the false messiahs come. And part of what they do is they, they deceive people through signs and wonders that instead of leading people to Jesus, these signs and wonders are leading people to the beast and eventually to destruction. Um Continuing in verse 14, it, uh, the false prophet, it deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that it is permitted to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Okay, so, so there's still some more in Revelation 13, but uh, I want to save that for another message, Lord willing. But what I want to do now is I want to step back and take a, a look at the big picture of what is going on here. And uh, we, we'll, we'll do this for the rest of the message. Um, so we all know uh, that Christian belief is that there is a holy trinity, that God is a trinity, one God but three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, what we see in the book of Revelation is a unholy trinity that's opposed to God. And the unholy trinity, now the, the book of Revelation doesn't use the phrase unholy, tr unholy trinity, 
but many, many people who have read and studied the book feel like this is what's going on, that, um, uh, th th that the devil is trying to copy what God is like because the devil wants to be like God. He wants to rule the universe. He wants everybody to worship him. Uh, he wants everybody to do his will. So he wants to be in the place of God. So he kind of sets up this unholy trinity uh, the dragon, that, that of course is the devil, and the beast, that's evil human governments that persecute God's people, and the false prophet. Uh, and, and, and that would be uh, manifest in the world throughout history as false religions, although there may be one terrible final false prophet still coming. False, false teachers, false religions, false worldviews. So, so the devil has this, this false uh, trinity. Um, now, the, uh, th there's a lot of similarities. Um, in the real trinity, the son, Jesus, dies and comes back to life. He's resurrected. And when we look at the unholy trinity, uh, the beast, uh, it appears that the beast dies. And, and I don't know if he's going to literally die and literally come back to life, but uh, that's certainly the language that we find in Revelation. And I think it's entirely possible that there will be some kind of literal death and resuscitation coming back to life of some type. Uh, so he's imitating what, what God did. And then um, the son receives power, authority, and a kingdom from the father in the, in the Holy Trinity. But in the unholy Trinity, the beast receives power, authority, and a kingdom from the dragon. Now, are these things exactly the same? Well, both of them involve ruling over all the nations, languages, and peoples on the earth. But they are not the same in every way because the son's kingdom is going to last forever and ever. Hallelujah. Whereas the beast's kingdom uh, only lasts for a short time. The Bible says 42 months. And this is one of the many cases where I don't know if the 42 months is literal or symbolic. But one thing I know for sure is it's a very short time compared to how long Jesus' kingdom is going to last. Uh, but there is this, this, this uh, evil, twisted imitation that the, that the devil does. And then the Holy Spirit leads people to worship the Son, leads people to worship Jesus. And the false prophet, what's he going to do? He's going to, he leads people to worship the beast. And um, the Holy Spirit performs signs and wonders that lead, people, uh, that lead to people worshiping Jesus. Um, we, we see a lot of this in the Bible during, when Jesus was alive and then in the book of Acts. But around the world today, the Holy Spirit still does miracles. Um, now, miracles, I'm not saying they're common or everyday events. I, they're, not, they're not in my life, that's for sure. But, but I definitely believe that God is still working miracles by the Holy Spirit that help people come to faith in Jesus. And the false prophet performs signs and wonders that lead people uh, that lead to people worshiping the beast. Um, now there's more. There's more coming in the rest of the book of Revelation where we can see these two sides contrasted. Uh, later in the book of Revelation, uh, we're going to find out about the bride of Christ in the New Jerusalem. We already know about the church. The church has been in the book of Revelation since uh, the first chapter. Um, but the church is symbolized as the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. And, um, and, 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 and then also the people of God, the church, are, are symbolized as the New Jerusalem. And that doesn't mean that there's not going to be also a literal uh, New Jerusalem on the new earth. I personally think there, there, there will be. Um, but that beautiful, brilliant city is, is also serving as a symbol of God's people, God's transformed people, God's holy people, God's redeemed people, forgiven. Uh, our sins have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, and we're living with God forever. Well, it turns out that the dragon, uh, the unholy trinity, also has a people. And uh, the Bible refers to this as the world. Uh, so, so as Christians, we live in the world, but we are not of the world. But there are lots of people who never get saved 
who are of the world. And, and instead of the bride of Christ, the unholy trinity has the prostitute. Uh, so the bride of Christ is a beautiful, holy, pure bride. The prostitute is the opposite of that. And just as there's a beautiful city coming that represents God's people, the New Jerusalem, there's also Babylon. Now, Babylon looks also to be like a beautiful city, but it, it's deceptive, and it ends up destroying. The people in it are destroyed, and Babylon is destroyed. It's alluring. It's very, it's very dangerous. I honestly, in my prayer life, when I think about being on guard against all of the forces of evil and, 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 and all that the devil's doing, um, I tend to probably spend more time praying for protection for myself and my family and my church family and others from, from what, would, what would be described in Revelation as Babylon. I, I, I'm even more concerned about Babylon in some ways than I am about the beast and the false prophet. They're all terrible things. The beast evil human government, the false prophet, false religion, and false worldviews. But Babylon is the alluring, seductive, tempting uh, nature of the world that offers temporary comforts and pleasures and luxuries. But if you go after those things, it leads to death and destruction. So Bab we'll, we'll talk about Babylon more uh, as we go through the rest of the book of Revelation. But um, so, there, so there's these two sides that we see uh, uh, laid before us throughout the book of Revelation. And one thing that is very clear from the book of Revelation and really from the whole Bible uh, is very clear in, in many ways. The, 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 the Bible makes this clear. Everyone has to choose a side. Uh, no one like some some people might might want to just not be involved in this whole thing. Well, if they, if they are trying to be like that, they're really going to end up with the dragon. Um, you have to choose a side. Everybody's either under the influence of the unholy trinity, under the influence of the dragon. Uh, they're in, they're living in, and are part of the Babylon evil world system. Or... They're part of the truth church of Jesus, the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem. God is our heavenly father. Jesus is our Lord and king. The Holy Spirit is guiding and empowering us. Um, it's one or the other. Now, a major purpose, um, maybe the major purpose, certainly a very important purpose of the book of Revelation is to motivate you to choose Jesus. And to, and to hang on to Jesus your whole life, not to give up on following uh, him. And um, part of the way that the, the book of Revelation does this several ways. One way it does this is by helping us to see the nature of the choice. Because if we just look around the world and we don't have God's revelation to help us, we would probably all end up uh, choosing to follow the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon, and to be part of Babylon because we, we don't want to be persecuted and because Babylon's offering us temporary uh, comforts and luxuries and pleasures, and we want to go along with the majority, want to go along with the crowd. But the book of Revelation helps us to see the true nature of the world, that, is, that, that, that th the world system is evil, it's deadly, is, uh, it, it, and that is a twisted imitation of God's goodness. But then another way that the book of Revelation helps to motivate us to choose Jesus is it tells us how things turn out. And this is probably the biggest one. In the end, uh, the whole right side of this picture, the, whole, the unholy trinity, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, and everybody who follows them, uh, the world, everyone who's seduced by the prostitute, who, who wants to be part of the Babylon system, uh, all of those people and all of those evil forces are going to be completely, they're going to be judged and they are going to be completely and utterly destroyed by God's wrath. Um, and, 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 but all of the people who persevere, even if it costs us our lives, even if we have to endure opposition, persecution, uh, we persevere, we follow Jesus, we follow the Father, 
we believe in the gospel, uh, we don't give up on God's mission. Uh, we are part of the church, the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem. We are going to live forever and ever in glory where there'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more tears. And so it tells us how, how it's going to turn out. And that should really help us to choose what side to be on. Um, now the book of Revelation, we're jumping way ahead here, it, it, it closes with an invitation. Because people, some people are in the world right now, but you don't have to stay in the world. Both the Spirit and the Bride, that's the Holy Spirit and God's people, Christians, are giving a message. They're saying, come, come to Jesus. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life freely. Uh, let the one who desires take the water of life freely. Uh, let me get the intonation right there. So, um, yes, so there's this invitation that um, people who are in the world now don't have to stay in the world. Uh, people can, can move from being under the, the kingdom of the devil and come into God's kingdom and have your sins forgiven and be redeemed and receive the gift of eternal life. And I pray that if anyone who's listening to this is not in God's kingdom, that you will choose to follow uh, Jesus. I'm going to close in prayer in just a a minute. I want to mention some possible topics for next week, um, next week's message. The role of signs and wonders, I mentioned that a little bit, but it's really emphasized in chapter 13, so I might want to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and it's talked about in other parts of the Bible a lot as well. Uh, and then what an evil alliance between oppressive government and false religion looks like in history, around the world today, and possibly in the future. This is what's going on with the unholy trinity. Uh, evil, oppressive governments are um, partnering with false religions and false worldviews. The devil is behind it all. So, so I, I might want to talk about some examples of that throughout history in the world today. And then the, the book of the, I'm sorry, the chapter 13 ends with the infamous 666 and the mark of the beast and economic pressure. So talk about that also. So I want to close in prayer, and I want to do. I, I don't do this very often in my videos, but I want to. If anyone is listening to this, and you're not sure that you're part of God's people, you're not sure that you're part of the bride of Christ, and you want to be because you want to be on the right side, you want to be on with the good guys, and you want to be with the people who are going to have eternal life. Um, you can say this prayer uh, a a after me, Heavenly Father. I confess that I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. But I believe you sent Jesus to save me. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I trust in him as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for my sins. I want the free water of life. I want eternal life with Jesus. I want to follow you. Strengthen me to follow you in this dark world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And I pray also that God will bless this video, bless those who are listening to it, and that God will strengthen uh, all of us to not give in to the beast, the false prophet, and the allurement of Babylon, and to remember that the devil is behind all that, but to stay with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.